Welcome to Any Honey and the Newt. Welcome to another episode of Any Honey in the Newt. So we are glad to be chatting with you. How are you doing today, Anthony? I Today is a fine day. I find it quite nice. Yeah, yeah pleasant day. Good, good. Pleasant day. You know, I, I had uh, a wonderful dinner last night, and I figured it would be a good time to talk about it because of our topic today. I had pizza with pepperoni, jalapeno, and pineapple. Now, are are you a pineapples allowed on pizza kind of guy? Oh no! Oh no! You did not <laughs> just go there. Pineapple on pizza? Oh, I can't even. <laughs> Actually, I thought that you were a strict no pineapple on pizza person. <laughs> I am not a strict. Pretty much any anything can go on pizza in my mind, but. Uh, when, when uh, I started eating pineapple was when I was trying to go vegetarian for a second time years ago, and I was replacing my meats with things like pineapple just to give it a different kind of flavor. And then I found out that I actually like the pineapple complement to a, a good salty pepperoni or ham. So I, I am a convert to that, uh, you know, to the idea that pineapple belongs on pizza. Interesting. You know, I I've never gotten into it, and I'll. I, I think it has a lot to do with my childhood, not specifically my upbringing, but when I was a kid and I was forced to eat pineapple and ham pizza, I just didn't like the flavors back then, and I really never came back to it as an adult. Um, but as you know, I'm a very, I'm a very, uh, I think I always have to have pepperoni on my pizza, like at the very least. Like mm. if it's not there, I just. I, I, I don't want to say I <laughs> it's won't not pizza. eat it. It's not pizza, basically. <laughs> and then to to your point, I saw um, there was like this John Oliver skit. And uh, he had this clip of Bill de Blasio, the mayor of New York, um, like trying to explain rank voting by voting for pizza topping preferences. Have you seen this clip? I have, and I'm glad that you're going to bring it up because I think we're going to end up on opposite sides of the fence on this one. <laughs> and his number one preference was uh, black olives, and then his number two preference was green bell peppers. And I'm just like, I could understand putting either one of those on a pizza, but as the number one and number two toppings for your voting system? Come on, dude. And that guy had a list of like pepperoni, <laughs> ham, uh, mushrooms. And I'm like, any of these other choices are definite number one toppings, but not either of those two. <laughs> You know what's hilarious? Because uh, I did. I saw this sketch and I was yelling at the screen. My one of my favorite pizzas of all time is black olive and green pepper. <laughs> <laughs> so you were yelling and I love that. Pizza. <laughs> <laughs> you, you were relling, uh You were relishing in it. <laughs> yeah. Now I would prefer a green green olive on pizza because it's salty, right? So it gives you a little bit more contrast with the with the pizza. But if I'm going to have black olive, the other thing I want on the pizza is green pepper. And if I get a third topping, it's going to be mushroom. Like, that is a great pizza to me. I have no problem with the mushroom and bell pepper part of it. Um, <laughs> and, and actually, uh, recently I was turned on to by our good friend Sarah Coffee. Um, I was turned on to a new, another kind of vegetarian pizza. And uh, this local pizza place, Mario, shout out to Mario's, they make yes. this gourmet veggie and they put fried eggplant on it. Oh my yeah. God. So good. My mind was blown. And I was like, if this is on my pizza every day, I can go vegetarian. <laughs> I, yeah, definitely shout out to Mario's. My my pick for the um, second best pizza in Albuquerque. Ooh, what's your first best? <laughs> I am. I was going to give them props, and I cannot think of their name right now. It's the one on uh, San Mateo that used to be called. G Is it Geno's? Uh, or did they change the name? I feel like they changed the name. Yeah, I think they were Geno's, and I think now they're like Aldo's or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Whatever that place is called, they they have my number one pick. Interesting. I had never, 
I feel like they changed their name four times in the time that I lived there. <laughs> I haven't had them in a long time. Man, that brings back some memories. So we <laughs> we clearly uh, have different preferences in pizza. Um, but what the heck does this have to do with what we're talking about today? Uh, yeah, well, that, great, great. I did get kind of sidetracked talking about food. <laughs> Me? It was all about pizza. And I was like, hold the phone. No philosophy today. Just pizza. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, I think what's clear is that I'm objectively right about what's good on pizza. And if you disagree with me, that's when you're objectively wrong. I mean, sometimes your tastes are aligned with mine and show that you can have some good taste. But otherwise, it's just objective that my tastes are the right tastes. Hold the phone, dude. No, <laughs> you, you didn't even give me a system with which to evaluate pref- uh, our, our taste in pizza. I need some categories here. <laughs> right. <laughs> Obviously, uh, I'm I'm taking a kind of straw man approach. A lot of people, I think, would say that tastes are relative; that everybody has their own taste, and for most people, that's okay. Like we disagree about what things we like, and and often we say, "Well, to each their own." Right. The question that I think we want to explore today is this relationship between subjectivity, having an individual point of view, and an individual perspective. And applying values when we talked about our structure last week of having something that we're evaluating and appealing to some kind of standard by which we judge. Is, are the standards for taste individual or is there something like an intersubjective or objective standard that we're using to make these evaluations? So today we're going to talk about taste. Those are, those are really good questions. Um, and last week we ended on the like MVP debate right uh of basketball nba of basketball uh sorry mvp of the nba um and uh what you just asked made me think about like the categories that we brought up for that classic mvp discussion um they're presented as an attempt towards like an objective and uh, evaluation of mvp Right, but a lot of the arguments skew towards uh, at least the media's preferences in categories for MVP. And how do we reconcile those like uh, seemingly combined things, but really they're at least a little bit in opposition to each other? No, that's great. Uh, so in the GOAT conversation, when you talk about like titles, uh, championships one, that's a countable stat that has an objective number historically verified. Like we can, we can show that somebody has six rings or four rings or whatever, and six is more than four. Like all of that seems to be a very clear objective standard. But we also mentioned how that isn't the only criteria that's used, and some people don't use that criteria at all. So when you have a complex standard that has multiple components and you can weigh the components differently that's where i think subjectivity comes in so if the standard had five components and we decide to grant each component 20 percent weight in the in our evaluation and everybody did that we should all arrive pretty close to the same conclusion um we might not all agree on how to apply 20 percent. like we might think that the rings issue being applied 20 percent still matters a lot and others might say well it's only a one-fifth category it doesn't matter that much like that that might be just an epistemic problem of us not knowing how to apply 20 percent but objectively there should be an outcome where everything is balanced and, and weighed appropriately but that's not how it works right we get all these criteria and people get to kind of use what matters to them more so the ratio of of which criteria and how they balance is different for each individual. So subjectivity, even though we're using objective criteria. Yeah, that's a really good point, right? It sounds like um, just the ambiguity in the evaluation system allows for it to be uh, ambiguous in how the voting actually takes place, right? Uh, Versus Mm -hmm. like if all the media members got together and they essentially decided on what the voting system looks like and then they kind of pick their preferences within that, but then weighted it according to the, you know, essentially like what their, their evaluation system is, then that would become more uh, objective. It sounds like they need sort of like a council of Nicaea 
of uh, <laughs> NBA media personalities. Oh, right. Yeah. And, and then we can have the dogmas of basketball. <laughs> <laughs> Is that even That's your fantastic. favorite council? <laughs> it's one of my least favorite councils, but I can't remember the ones I, I did like. So. I can't remember any of them. I'm so ashamed, but not really. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know that you should be ashamed. It was my undergraduate major. And I can't remember them. <laughs> So uh, anyway, I think that what we did last week was kind of set up a way to approach this question of taste, because this applies, I mean, we were talking about pizza, which is food, and then we kind of talked about preferences, but this kind of applies to a lot of different things, the kinds of arts and entertainment that you, uh, one, will, will participate in, and two, enjoy, like how much enjoyment do you get out of those things, it seems to be related to the individual participating or, or or observing those those things uh similarly with fashion you know do you do you care about trends in fashion do you have a uh subculture that you like to identify with how much of it is i is wrapped up in identity and how much of it is actual taste uh is there a biological factor is it a psychological factor is it a cultural factor a lot of questions here yeah and i'll even go a step further there's a lot of jobs that are they're kind of like towing this line of subjectivity, objectivity. Um, you mentioned uh, the arts, right? And there's like basically anybody who's a critic who treats that professionally. They're trying to like get to some objective truth about the art evaluation. But at the same time, um, there's not, you know, one tried and true method for evaluating art. So you have different critics evaluating the same piece in different ways. Uh, I just watched the movie Tenet, so... I was thinking about movie critics specifically, but I mean, it happens everywhere. Um, and then even in my own field in museum, the museum realm, there's <clears throat> museum evaluation. And even within that, there's a spectrum of like full on research, which is extremely objective focused. And then there's, you know, on the very informal end, you know, an, an educator like myself going into a program and then uh, basically choosing to evaluate the program, I'm putting it in air quotes uh, in my example here, but choosing to evaluate the program based on the criteria that I think are important in that moment, right? Like how engaged the learners are. And that's very like, I'm evaluating based on my preferences and I'm looking for criteria based on my own preferences too. So it's a little circular in that, in that statement, but um, there at least still is some evaluation. So it, it's like not quite extremely on the taste side, but it's starting to become a little bit more objective. Yeah, that, there's so much there that I want to unpack. Uh, and it's probably better that I don't just kind of list them all off instead, just go one at a time. So let me start with the kinds of tastes that do seem to be biological, right? So, so we have taste buds, right? That separate into sour, bitter, salty, um, and sweet. And so there's like, maybe, maybe we can determine why somebody would like sweeter foods than someone else by evaluating their, their tongue or, or the nervous system reaction to the stimulation of the taste buds, that kind of thing. But we also know like in child development, most kids don't like certain kinds of tastes early on, like vegetables often have a very bitter kind of taste and kids reject vegetables, you know, even before they could talk, they're spitting them out and, and like avoiding it. Um, and then like, we have to teach them to, to eat their vegetables. And now I love vegetables. Like I love, I had asparagus yesterday in my uh, eggs and oh my goodness, I just love asparagus, but I did not as a kid. <laughs> my parents still do not like uh, a lot of green vegetables. Um, so I wonder how much of it is biological, how much of it is familiarity, and is there something else going on? Like, what are the factors that contribute to personal taste? Ooh, those are really good questions. And actually, I wanted to bring that up too, so I'm glad you did it now. Um, so first, I'll start with, uh, it's not just kids. Also, my wife does not like vegetables. I have to train her to eat her vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> um, and for me, what's interesting, growing up, I, even at a very young age, really liked broccoli, which is a common gross kid food, right? I love broccoli. If, if there was broccoli on the side, I was eating it all. 
Um, <clears throat> but I didn't like Brussels sprouts growing up. Uh, but then now, I still obviously love broccoli. My preference in that taste hasn't changed. Uh, but I really do like Brussels sprouts and asparagus you picked out also. And like those are flavor profiles that I grew to love. And I'm choosing those words specifically because I remember not liking them. And now my preferences have changed. So I'm going to say that I'm going to use the word grow because right now we have no other language for it. But hopefully as we talk through this episode, we'll we'll have developed that. And the other thing that I wanted to add was uh, there's an XKCD comic that I absolutely love. <clears throat> and it's about um, two people. One person is saying that uh, how can you eat this cheap? How can you drink this gross, cheap wine? And the other person is saying, well, all wine tastes the same to me. And the first person says, well, you know, if you give wine a chance, you'll find that there's a whole world here. And But the second person uh, points out that you can say that about anything. If you spend enough time with anything, you will find, you know, nuance within that realm. And so they go into this box for a year uh, evaluating 500 still frames of Joe Biden eating a sandwich. And they start, <laughs> they start having a conversation about which frames they prefer. Um, and it kind of as the joke, they're like, one of them says, this frame number, I think it was like 400 something, of Joe Biden uh, biting into the sandwich really encapsulates the mayo that makes that sandwich great. And uh, the, fir- the second person says, well, of course you're gonna pick a mayo frame. That's super obvious. But in this other frame, if you like mayo, then this one is in my top ten because of X and Y reasons. And so that <laughs> that really got me thinking about how much of our own experience lends into the things we do and don't like. But then also, does that extend to values, even in an objective way? Yeah, so... There is something I think to be said about exposure and familiarity. I mean, Australians eat Vegemite as a regular snack and it's kind of reputed as uh, way too salty for a lot of non, you know, people that aren't used to it. <clears throat> so a lot of people are just like, this is disgusting. You know, well, how, how do you eat this? And, and uh, I saw a thing where Mar- Margot Robbie was like, this is comfort food. <laughs> like it needs a cracker, but it's a very comforting kind of thing. Um, so then that made me think of my friend who hates pickles. And I know we have other friends like that too, but, but this <laughs> friend has a uh, kind of a tradition that once a year he's going to try pickle because he has realized over the course of his life that his tastes have changed and sometimes things he used to not like, he came to like. And so he's like, I don't want to miss out. If all of a sudden my tastes change and I like pickles, I don't want to miss out on pickle opportunities. But if they're still disgusting, then I can just, I don't have to worry about it for another year. <laughs> so I, I like his approach of, uh, you know, it's okay to reject things as not being of your taste, but recognizing that your tastes are not fixed, that you are a changing person, and that applies physiologically and psychologically. That's very, very mature of your friend there. <laughs> Some foods are just yeah. hard, hard to come, like, not just... Uh... You know, you might have strong preferences, but they like the flavor is very strong itself. And then to be able to recognize that they change and you have to get over whatever's in your head about that thing to like bring yourself to try it again. Um, You mentioned the biological taste buds. Right. And I've I'm pretty sure I've mentioned this on a previous episode, um, but we've spent all this time talking about norms and values that I can't help but think about this again which is that our own very taste buds, they recognize these things, but our brain processes the flavors and gives us on a subconscious level um, essentially reactions to it, but that's a bit trivializing it, right? So like things taste bitter to us as a warning essentially, like this food is potentially poisonous. Um, Things taste sweet and salty to us Um, not just in a way that induces pleasure in our brains, but also as a way to trigger our body to start producing the right chemical content. And also because those are supposed to be very nutritious for us, right? Like when we were ancestral cave people 
and monkeys, salty foods are, were essentially the things that carried all the amino acids. I mean, they still are. They carry all the amino acids and proteins that our body needs, and sweeter things were the things that carried all the vitamins, all the essential vitamins that we don't get from other occurring foods, right? So they served not just a, a food purpose and a pleasure purpose, but also this biological sense, and our brain did that pre-processing for us. So it's kind of like, it feels like this, like, objective beginnings to a subjective component which we're trying to get back to objectivity no that's really good and it reminds me of another example of someone who uh so we have the reaction the physiological reaction somebody would eat something spicy and that kind of attack on their body was something they were like i don't want this right that was the reaction was um you know it's hot it's spicy it hurts and they're interpretation of that is i don't want that and then at some point they decided to give it a try uh like and and say okay this is what spicy tastes like and i like it then all of a sudden they wanted to put spicy stuff on all other foods because now it was like i want to i'm craving that experience that reaction that we get from a spicy encounter is not a bad thing it's a, it can be a good thing and and it just like flipped a switch in their mind which is kind of crazy. That's the objective, like physiological reaction and a subjective interpretation of the experience. Yeah. Um, one thing that's always made me think about is <clears throat> uh, when we realize from experience, and I'm not sure if this is actually how the process goes. This is my interpretation of it. Uh, when we realize something is not dangerous to us from experience, we're willing, we're more willing to push the boundary on what it is that that thing can provide for us. I mean, think about like why people are thrill seekers. They go skydiving, cliff jumping, bungee jumping, all that sort of stuff, right? You have this like what terrifying experience and you're like, oh, I'm safe at the end. And uh, one, the adrenaline that's pumping is also kind of like invigorating and pleasurable, but also the fact that you survived it and you want to like <laughs> chase the thrill is like another aspect to it too. Yeah. Yeah, and some people are not thrill seekers, uh, right? Yeah. So they get that close to the edge, and they're like, I don't care if it's safe. I don't need to have that kind of anxiety, right? Yes. And so it's interesting. The same the same kind of feeling can have different uh, – you can still have different judgments about the feeling. And I always think Which about, gets – I'll just say this really quick. You know, I always think about, like, the first person – who ever ate a specific kind of food that became that thing. Uh, a kid the other day was talking about escargot, like who would just decide to eat a snail? Mm. And I'm like, yeah, that's true. You see this like slimy thing walking around. You're definitely not like, oh, this looks delicious tasting. Except <laughs> when you have a good escargot experience, you're like, okay, I can't wait to eat that in a little bit. <laughs> Oh yeah, oh yeah. Of course, it's mostly just butter, right? Yeah. <laughs> but it's you really still delicious. like the butter and garlic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm a sucker, though. Give me that butter delivery system. Uh, <laughs> so I do think that this leads us to the next kind of question, which is: All right, so there's some kind of process that's going on that affects us, and then we not only react to it, but we judge it as good or bad. So that experience is a good experience. I, I approve of that. I want more of that. Is that judgment cognitive, emotive, or something else? And, and just to let me qualify that, when I say pineapple on pizza is delicious, am I making a claim, like asserting a, a truth, a, a potentially truth-bearing claim? Or am I merely saying something like, yay, pineapple on pizza like rah 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 i don't, I don't know, i'm not making any claims about it i just cheered i endorse it kind of emotionally that makes me happy that's interesting um because to me in the second phrasing the endorsement it's still a little bit the first thing <laughs> you, you, you and I have been talking for way too long. <laughs> I kind of oh, feel that too. <laughs> now you just made me realize like you've been subtly brainwashing me for like 10 years almost. <laughs> uh, no, you just anticipate where the, the logic of the things that we've talked about. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, there's this big debate in philosophy about our 
are those kind of statements about taste really even judgments? Like, is it fair to put them in a in a kind of realm of scrutiny? Like, should food criticism even be a thing? Oh, interesting. What's your sense on that? Like, should food criticism be a thing? Well, like uh, we kind of gave gave it away a little bit. I agree with you that yay and boo ha- carry cognitive judgments with them. So I I don't separate the two as easily as people that want to say it's just emotional. It's just an emotive kind of cheering on, which is individual. Since since everybody can have their own emotions, and the emotions are unique experiences, there's no comparison. Like my happiness can't be compared to your happiness on some kind of objective standard. So since it's emotive, there's no such thing as like an actual judgment. Uh, to me, that seems bizarre. I feel like yay asserts some kind of implicit judgment. Yeah, we haven't talked much about experience this season. And when we do, we'll kind of come back to this. But I think if you have uh, beings who experience differently, the you, yay and boo might be more of just an endorsement rather than, or I should say it it might have no component of the objectivity, but right. Like if you're, if you said to a rock, uh, which we could argue if a rock experiences or not. Right. But uh, if you, if you argue to a rock that pizza with pepperoni is delicious and pizza with pineapple is disgusting, the rock is probably just gonna be like, okay, congratulations, dude. Uh, and maybe give you a high five or maybe it has its own personal preferences and it's like, yeah, but this circular rock over here is delicious when you add this this little bit of quartz to it and you're just like, WTF, man. <laughs> <laughs> and just for our listeners, because you and I have had conversations about philosophical <clears throat> zombies and rocks that think. So I just want to put out to our listeners, like <clears throat> Anthony's not, um, not losing it. He's not expecting like <laughs> rocks to have their own sentience. Uh, it's a philosophical example we've been toying with. Yeah, and we'll bring it out uh, in a future episode. But basically, like I was just trying to pick something so different than and I could have used, I guess, an alien civilization. Because like if we had said like monkeys or, or dolphins, which we think of as sentient at least, um, there's evidence that they are. Then they might have because they have the same. Um, phylogenomic origins as us they might have the same preferences so i tried to separate it at least as far down the phylogenomic tree as possible even though there's (laughs) there's no uh organic chemistry going on in a rock so (laughs) (laughs) right uh at least it doesn't seem like it would produce any kind of um taste reaction right uh that being said since I've already kind of given away the hand that I do think that there is some kind of judgment going on, we get to an interesting quandary. When I say that pineapple on pizza tastes great, and you say not only does it taste great, you're violating the rules of pizza, uh, <laughs> are we actually disagreeing? Because one way that we can interpret what's going on there is that I'm saying pineapple on pizza affects my physiology in a way that i find pleasurable and you can agree with that statement right and you can say pineapple on pizza affects my physiology in a way that i find unpleasant unpleasurable and i can agree with that right so if we both agree with both statements there's no real disagreement we're not disagreeing about the same thing we're making two separate claims right so when i say pineapple on pizza is delicious Am I making a claim that we can both agree or disagree upon? Or or am I merely making a personal kind of... Do we have to interpret that statement as, to Corbin's body, pineapple on, on pizza makes a good reaction, has a good reaction? Oh, man, how do we not keep bringing up previous episodes into this conversation? <laughs> I'm like... Because to that, right... There, I mean, there obviously is interpretation, right? You say something, and I have to put that in a way that means something to me. And so uh, because you use the word delicious, right, um, and just like we said before, that word delicious means something to you, and it does mean something to me. And a lot of times we're in the same situation, and you say something's delicious, and then I say it's delicious, and I'm like, okay, I am 90% sure that we agree what delicious means, right? And so we go down that rabbit hole. Um, And unless you 
use it in a different context in a different situation i have no bearing with which to say does he mean delicious as good or does he mean delicious as physiologically beneficial <laughs> right right i mean we could break down we could make statements about pineapple on pizza i don't know the food chemistry well enough but like talk about its acidity and its interaction between the different chemicals involved and how that produces certain um balances of of i don't know sugar to protein i don't know what you know what to use there as an example but we can make all of those claims and those are observable testable claims right it seems like we could come to determine the truth value of those claims but then when i say pineapple on pizza is delicious am i just saying all of those things plus yay <laughs> like is it am i just emotively adding on to those assertions or am I making an additional claim separate from it produces this kind of acidity balance to, and that is a good thing. We ought to want to enjoy that experience. Let me throw in this other example, and I don't want to get too off track. So please let me know if this does go down, down that way. Um, there's a, I can't remember exactly what the name of it is. A, a type of berry. Have you heard of this? I don't know. So no, it, I don't know. It changes the flavor profile of the food that you eat. And uh, oh. if, if you eat spicy food after consuming this berry, uh, those foods taste sweet. Oh. Yeah. <clears throat> and bitter foods taste a little different as well. Um, so we tried it, and you know, you could just like wolf down a whole jalapeno and not feel anything. Um, what's interesting, though, is you still feel some of the characteristics of the spicy food, like, you know, how, like, your lips get tingly afterwards, um, maybe a little numb. <clears throat> and so you feel some of that, but the flavor is, like, completely different to your brain. And so mm. I bring that up as, like, a, you know, if you ate a jalapeno and said it was spicy, and then I just so happened to eat one of these things and then eat a jalapeno and was like, no, that's sweet, but you like spicy foods and I don't, and we're both like, this is delicious. What happens right. in that context? Yeah. So there's, here's one possible solution is that we can say that pineapple on pizza or, or the spicy food after the goji berry is tasty to me. Right. And you can even agree with that. You could say, sure, I, I can see that you enjoy that experience. And, and vice versa, you can say it's tasty to me. And and even if I in, recognize that it's true, that it's tasty for you, we're not in agreement about the same claim, right? We're each making separate claims that happen to have tasty to me in the predicate. But that's okay, right? Like, so one possible solution is all we're really doing is indexing the taste profile to the person making the judgment. And so it's true or false based on whether the speaker, whether or not it's true for the speaker. So is pineapple on pizza tasty? Well, I don't know. Who's who's saying it? If if I'm saying it, then yes, it's true. If you're saying it, then no, it's false. Okay? So that's one possible solution. But then we can never really disagree. And there's no such thing as a disagreement in taste. Because all what we're really saying is to each their own. Everybody has their own preferences. Yeah, and then in that in that world, right, we would never interject with anything like "you're crazy," right? Or, or I mean, we might, but that would be misunderstanding the situation. Like we have misinterpreted what they're saying, right? Yeah. Now, David Hume presents a problem for this. He said, you know, if we're just going by personal preference and popularity then and i don't remember the guy's first name but this poet ogilby who was highly popular in hume's time would be a much would be considered a much better poet than john milton you know paradise lost and paradise regained like we, we considered the, that poetry to be kind of like in the canon of of english literature and so he's like milton is obviously a superior poet to ogilby <laughs> The popularity of Ogilvy does not make him a better poet than than Milton, and so he's he's saying he's basically playing on our intuitions. He's not providing the criteria why Milton is better, but he thinks that most reasonable 
educated people uh, who speak English will read the two poets and come away thinking, yeah, Milton is the superior poet. And I think we this happens with your wine example, right? Like if you study wines and, and uh, come to have a discerning taste or a discerning palate, we might call it, we think that you're using a standard that all unophiles, I think is the term for people who love wine, um, you're appealing to a standard that they could all recognize with experience and training to develop, right? And so are there criteria for taste that can be shared intersubjectively? And how is that possible if taste is merely individual preference? Very good points. Um, I just want to make a quick correction. The berry, I had to Google it. Uh, the berry that I mentioned earlier is an M berry, not a goji berry. That's a totally different berry. Okay. Okay. So, so do you think that there can be criteria like <clears throat> are art critics pointing to some kind of inner subjective standard or are they merely getting paid to tell us about their personal preferences? I, oh, okay. I think that there is some inner subjective standard. And um, one of the things that is leading me to believe that is uh, Netflix is a great example of this, right? They are basically trying to create a formula that allows the algorithm to select movies that line up with your preferences, your individual preferences, based on things that you like uh, and based on things that basically other people like that are sort of in the same realm of those preferences. Right? So, like, back in the, the five-star days, uh, it would rank, it would show you movies based on your preferences. If if it thought that you thought would love this movie, it would show it to you as a five star rating. It would show it to you as a three star rating. If it thought that you would think that you would watch it, but that it was like just okay, right? Now we just get the plus or minus, the thumbs up, thumbs down, um, and it kind of just tells you a per within a percentage what your preferences are. Like if you if you like this movie and other movies like it, ninety percent chance you're gonna like this movie. If, you know, you like this movie and a few other movies, but a lot of other movies in this category you didn't like, it's going to be like a 65% chance that you're going to like this other movie that we're showing you here. And so, uh, to me, if it was all just individual preferences and you could never cross boundaries, essentially, um, you know, we would never be able to relate to each other, I feel like this mathematical formula wouldn't be possible. And maybe that's nice. a big leap. <laughs> can you say what? Can, can you say a little bit more why you think that would be a difficult or impossible task to achieve? Uh, I, I'm very sympathetic, but I want to make sure that I'm not reading into what you're saying. Okay, I don't. So I said that, but I don't quite know what what intuition is there that tells me the closest thing I have for it is that. Uh language is based on rules and math is another set of these rules um, and in some cases it can be used as a language and so like basically you're just translating from one language to another in this case to me and so I think that's why <laughs> so so I think there's something going back to our language is normative kind of conversation I think there's something about what is it that my thumbs up or thumbs down represents? Because as we've already distinguished, like there's a difference between the assertions I can make about the movie, right? This is an action film. It has a lot of violence or little violence, or it's very gory, right? Like we can put things and and even those are vague terms, but we still kind of can can identify more or less, right? We can find out the, the elements of sound, like maybe this is a very quiet movie, very sparse sounds. Uh, maybe there's lots of sound effects and it's very loud and, and rambunctious. But my reaction to those objective kind of features and qualities is still separable, right? Like, like the earlier 
we can say that there's pineapple on pizza and that it produces this kind of acid uh, acidity, but do I like that or not? So when I thumbs up it, I the the algorithm or whatever, how is it supposed to interpret what features in that film I'm approving of or disapproving of? Like, since there's so many features in all of these films, like thumb, thumbs upping a bunch of them, I'm I'm not sure that it actually identifies criteria that we're appealing to, especially since I can see the criteria in one movie and have a positive reaction to it and the same criteria in another movie and have a negative reaction to it. Yeah. Um, one thing I'll add is uh, I think that kind of like, I don't know, it, that what you just said further entrenched this, this in my mind because um, there's so much entangled, right, in that gesture. But we're still communicating something. It's not like that gesture doesn't communicate anything, right? But then there's the fact that other people are relating their experience through a similar gesture to the same thing. So there's already a common anchor point. There's a similar language usage point, right? And uh, there's there's uh, I'll say there's a th at least a third category here, which is. Uh, Netflix is at, I'm pretty sure they at least categorize the movies, right? And I don't know if they go any levels deeper than that. They might, they might have like some features, like maybe it's like very uh, plot focused or very thematic or, but there's, there's essentially categories that they use to, to sparse out the movies, to index the movies, right? And so like, if you say you don't like this movie, it's still going to show you other movies within that category because it's like one point in a sea of a hundred or a thousand titles, right? But if a thousand other people say that they also don't like that movie, there's now there's like a, a common thread there. Maybe there's something about this movie that people don't like. And so it might suggest mm -hmm. that movie to other people less. But then also there's like, how well do those people's preferences line up with your preferences, right? And if mm -hmm. there's like a 75% overlap, it's going to show you movies that you haven't seen that other people have ranked highly because you have similar tastes because it doesn't matter like what you like or don't like about it. The fact is you like the same things and they like the same things. They like they don't like the same things and you don't like the same things. Yeah, I like that you put similar tastes in that in that analysis, right? Because uh, that that acknowledges maybe kind of the individual palette or or whatever the various combinations of things that you like and dislike. But there are still seemingly uh, relationships between those objective criteria and human reactions to them. So I'm not sure that it's as separable as we were trying to indicate earlier. So when I say that it's tasty to me, I think I'm I'm also kind of hoping that I'm venturing out that it's tasty to humans and that humans, uh, I want to know how close I am to other humans' experiences. So I do feel like sometimes our debates on taste are almost exploratory to kind of say how, how much is my experience relatable to yours? You, you have a very different life experience, a lot of particular episodes that I didn't go through, but are there enough general traits and enough objective characteristics that we can point to that help us relate to one another because we have similar life experiences, similar taste palettes, right? So I think this is where this individuality and subjectivity points to a larger inner subjectivity because we're still relating to a world that has features that are consistent for everyone. And uh, <clears throat> what you just said right there um, is like, I think that really encapsulates something that I've been thinking about all season long. And we're getting closer to being able to like ask the question officially, but it's like, essentially what is it that allows people to learn like wh mm. what about our experience allows people to learn and apparently tastes and preferences are heavily involved in that learning experience indeed <laughs>